The Morrow Castle was built in Newport News, Virginia, and first launched in 1930. The 508 foot ocean liner was named after the fortress Morrow Castle, which was built in Havana in 1589. The ship was designated as a TEL, which stands for Turbo Electric Liner. This advanced electric power allowed the Morrow Castle to hold the fastest record from traveling between Manhattan and Havana at 58 hours and 40 minutes total. For four years, the ship made weekly trips to and from Havana at this speed. Despite the depression at this time, the fares were low enough to attract a good amount of passengers. Fares ranged from $140 for an inside cabin, which would amount to about $2,141.61 in today's money, to $240 for a cabin deluxe, which would have come to about $3,671.33 in today's money. To put things into perspective, First-class tickets for the Titanic, which sailed 18 years earlier, were $70,000 each in today's money, and a second-class ticket, which would include mostly bunk beds, was $1,000 each in today's money, plus extras for certain views. A third-class ticket for the Titanic, which consisted of a cabin below deck shared with strangers and only one meal a day, was $700 in today's money. All things considered, Two to three thousand dollars for a ticket aboard the Morrow Castle was a steal. The style for the first cabin lodge seen on the left was inspired by Louis XVI and was adorned with bronze. The dance deck seen on the right included a ship inspired stage and hardwood floors to match. Entertainment in the dance deck often went until midnight and consisted of costume contests a tradition that was started and continued by passengers over the years. It also consisted of balloon dances, which were a burlesque type dance with prizes given to the winners. The veranda room, seen on the left, is where passengers would socialize and enjoy tea. The dining room, seen on the right, was ornately decorated and included a second story balcony from where one could view the luxurious space. All of the common areas of the ship included sparkling crystal light fixtures with mirrors on all sides of them, which filled the rooms with a dazzling glitter effect. The stateroom, seen on the left, was one of a variety of rooms offered aboard the Morrill Castle and included two beds, a dresser, a vanity, and portholes from which one could enjoy views of the sea. The writing room, seen on the right, was decorated in a French chateau style and allowed passengers to catch up on their correspondence. The writing room is where the fire was believed to have originated. Food aboard the Morrow Castle wasn't gourmet, but was still considered to be satisfying and delicious. The food ranged from staples to popular 1930s dishes, which could have included food disguises, a fad popular at this time. Food disguises were foods that were hidden within other foods, like pigs in a blanket, or mushrooms made out of cream cheese. Full breakfasts were served in the mornings and consisted of cereal, sausage, broiled kippered herring with mashed potatoes, omelets, waffles, pancakes, American and Cuban coffee, and Horlicks malted milk. For lunch, passengers had a choice between three entrees, like spare ribs or steak pie. Dinner consisted of five courses, including an appetizer, a soup, a fish course, an entree, and a dessert. In terms of drinks, they were available to passengers from morning to night. It was, after all, a big party ship. This breakfast menu, seen on the left, is dated just over a week before the disaster. For staff, however, life aboard the Morrill Castle wasn't so grand. Staff complained of low pay, poor living conditions, substandard food, and lack of time off to see their loved ones. In addition, there were reports of drug smuggling behind the scenes and refugees hidden away as cargo who suffered grueling conditions in hopes of a better life in America. On September 5, 1934, the Morrill Castle left Havana, aiming to reach New York in just 58 hours, as it had done hundreds of times before. However, this time, as the ship headed north, it encountered strong winds. A nor'easter was impending.
Captain Robert Wilmot was convinced he could outrace the storm. Two nights later, on September 7, 1934, Captain Wilmot complained of stomach pain after eating his dinner. Not too long after that, he was found dead in his cabin of an apparent heart attack. This resulted in Chief Officer William Worms to step up as acting captain, who continued through the increasingly stormy seas. The following day, September 8, 1934, a fire was discovered in a closet in the writing room. The ship, being made mostly of wood, coupled with the fanning flames of the nor'easter, allowed the fire to spread rapidly. To make matters worse, none of the ship's fire doors were activated, and many of the interior walls were lacquered, which fueled the fire. There was also a Lyle gun, which is a sort of cannon, stored above the writing room, and the gunpowder used in the Lyle gun caused an intense explosion. The fire spread so quickly that there was little time to act, let alone think. Many people were trapped in their staterooms, unable to escape the flames. Acting Captain Worms gave the order to send an SOS 39 minutes after the fire was first discovered. Once the Marine Station received the SOS, they alerted the Coast Guard stationed in New York. So much damage had already been done by that point, and so many more lives would be lost by the time help would finally arrive. Worms called for all 12 lifeboats, as well as a handful of rafts, to be deployed. Every single passenger and crewman could have fit into all lifeboats and rafts. However, half of the lifeboats could not be launched, as they were either blocked by the fire, had already burned, or were stuck because they had been accidentally painted to the ship. The lifeboats that were lowered were sent away with lots of empty seats, some carrying more crewmen than passengers. Soon after this, the engine died, and all communication with the engine room was lost. Worms ordered to drop anchor with the ship only three miles offshore. Within an hour after the ship dropped anchor, the winds had driven the fire to the room where Worms and several other officers were stationed. Worms and his officers moved to the tip of the upper deck, one of the only safe spots. People began to jump overboard, with and without life jackets, to escape the fire. It was essential for those with life jackets to tightly hold down the top edge of their life jackets when hitting the water. Those who did not either slipped out of their life jacket or were knocked unconscious on impact. This photo showed a guardsman sifting through clothing left behind in a haste by passengers who had to make a split decision. Franz de Beck was 18 years old when he boarded the Morrow Castle in 1934. He was a talented swimmer and track runner who was traveling to New York for a competition. Sadly, he and his mother had an argument before he left for his trip. His family had suffered an unusual number of casualties due to shipwrecks, and his mother was fearful that he would meet the same fate. Franz was sure he wouldn't. The night the ship caught fire, Franz and a man named Joseph Hidalgo, with whom Franz had been rooming, heard the commotion and quickly put on their life jackets and headed up to the top deck. The two men were searching for Rosario Camacho, a woman they'd met the day before, who they knew was traveling alone. When they found her, they saw she did not have a life jacket and both men proceeded to remove theirs to give to her. According to Hidalgo, Franz stopped him and said, Don't be ridiculous, you know I'm the better swimmer. Hidalgo put his life jacket back on. Not only did Franz give his life jacket away to Camacho, but he found and distributed life jackets to numerous other passengers as well, leaving himself entirely unprotected. As smoke filled the air, a passenger yelled that everyone was going to asphyxiate, which caused panic. So, Franz and Rosario held hands and jumped overboard together. Rosario survived, but Franz's body was never recovered. Selma and Charles Filzer, a married couple aboard the Morrow Castle, held hands as they jumped into the water. To survive, they clung to a dead body that was floating nearby for hours, until a large wave came and swept Charles away, never to be seen again. It was bittersweet for Selma that she was rescued hours after this harrowing ordeal.
This is a photo of Mervyn Bernstein, who was eight years old when he jumped off of the stern of the ship to his death. Tom Torreson, seen here in this photo as he speaks at the Seagirt Lighthouse, was only 17 years old when he took the job as third assistant for sewer aboard the Morrill Castle in 1934, a job that was only supposed to last the summer. When the fire broke out, Tom was terrified, yet still managed to rouse many passengers and guide them to the deck. He was soon approached by a person holding a small boy, around age 12, who was badly burned. The boy's name was Bobby Gonzalez. Tom took off his life jacket and tried to put it on the boy, but the jacket caused too much pain to Bobby's burned skin. After Tom put his life jacket back on, he spoke calmly to Bobby and gave him directions. Tom said the two were going to jump overboard, and that once they were in the water, Bobby should put his arms around Tom's neck. Together, they jumped. Once in the water, Bobby immediately grabbed onto Tom. For hours, they talked, prayed, and sang. Sadly, Bobby did not survive. The first rescue ship to reach the Morrow Castle was the SS Andrea F. Luckenbach, followed by the SS Monarch and the SS City of Savannah. The Coast Guard also responded. Despite the harsh conditions from the Nor'easter, locals banded in their efforts to rescue victims of the Morrow Castle disaster. A shining example of this is John Bohan and his sons, John Jr. and Jim, all three captains of fishing boats, who, along with several other of their friends and captains from other fishing boats, boarded the 60-foot Paramount and headed for the Morrow Castle. The men rescued a total of 67 people. Other fishing boats also responded and, collectively, rescued a few hundred more. If not for the bravery of these men, hundreds more might have perished. Lifeguard Tom Black was awakened by sirens in Seagirt, New Jersey. Instinctively, he and five other lifeguards grabbed their gear and headed for the seas. Along with Tom, shown in this picture, was Jack, Dick, George, Jack Little, and Elvin. These five tried to launch a lifeboat, but the waves were too hazardous. All they had at their disposal were their own efforts, and so they swam out and pulled survivors to shore. Not too long after, locals joined in their efforts and waded into the waters. Nearby residents took in survivors, who immediately called their loved ones to let them know they were alive. Local restaurants also aided in rescue efforts by providing food, and merchants offered dry clothing. Warning. The footage you are about to see may be disturbing to some viewers. Discretion is advised. If you want to look away and return when the video is finished, please be advised that it is three minutes long. This video has been granted use by the Asbury Park Historical Society.
will tell you her heartbreaking experience. And then Captain Jeffries of the Monarch of Bermuda will tell you his story. A temporary morgue was established in Seagirt, where more than 100 bodies were laid underneath white blankets. Relatives of the victims were guided through the morgue by soldiers, as they hoped not to have to identify their loved ones. Acting Captain Worms remained on board the Morrow Castle until one o'clock in the morning, refusing to leave until all passengers were off of the ship. At that time, the Coast Guard took control, the anchor was cut, and Worms finally left the ship. The Coast Guard attempted to tow the Morrow Castle to New York. However, the tow line snapped and the strong winds pushed the Morrow Castle toward Asbury Park Beach. In fact, the ship only narrowly avoided crashing into the convention hall. The Morrow Castle finally grounded to a halt after digging into the sandy bottom of the water, just a few hundred yards from the boardwalk. The charred wreck stayed there for six months, attracting millions of people to town. The Ocean County Library is in possession of a copy of this letter, which is housed in our Wheeler collection. This letter was written by the brother of a victim of the Morrow Castle disaster. The author of the letter, Benjamin Spector, was reaching out to the coroner who handled his sister's body. This letter depicts the heartbreaking reality that so many people experienced, who didn't know if their loved one made it, if they were safe, where their body was, or, in this case, if or for how long they suffered. The letter reads, Dr. William Borden, Coroner, Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Dear Dr. Borden, My sister, Frances Spector, was one of the victims of the Morrow Castle disaster. As a medical colleague, could you lighten my burden by giving me some information about her condition prior to her death? It would appear, in talking with her cabin mate, who survived, that she was one who reached ashore within several hours of the disaster. Was she partially conscious? How long did she live after being brought ashore? You know, sir, that any information would be of the greatest consolation and I shall pray that you will be gracious enough to answer this letter at your earliest convenience. Very truly yours, Benjamin Spector, M.D., Professor of Anatomy. The Ocean County Library is also in possession of a copy of this death certificate, which is housed in our Wheeler collection. This death certificate is for an 11-year-old girl named Marta Sanz Aguilera, who is from Havana. As you can see from this death certificate, the cause of her death is listed as accidental drowning, Morro Castle drowning. The Ocean County Library is in possession of a copy of this list of effects, which is housed in our Wheeler collection. This list of effects is for Minnie Hagedorn, who perished in the Morro Castle disaster along with her husband, Henry. The Hagedorns, originally from Brooklyn, New York, occupied cabin 332. The following items were found on Minnie's body when she was recovered. One diamond solitaire with platinum mounting on her left hand, her wedding ring. Two items of carved ivory, which were made in Germany. One change purse containing $12.54, which is about $250 in today's money. 
The Ocean County Library is in possession of a copy of this list of effects, which is housed in our Wheeler collection. This list of effects is for Henry Jacoby Sr. His last name is misspelled on this handwritten list of effects as having a C instead of a K. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, Henry was staying with his wife and son in cabin 351. He perished along with his son, Henry Jacoby Jr., 16 years old. His wife survived. The following items were found on Henry's body when he was recovered. Horn-rimmed glasses in case, one Parker pen. There's so much we weren't able to cover in this short presentation, such as, Worms was one of the last off the ship, but did you know he was later arrested? Also, someone may have poisoned the captain, and their suspicions of the fire having been deliberately set. Interested in reading more? Here are some books we have available at the Ocean County Library. Inferno at Sea, Stories of Death and Survival Aboard the Morrow Castle. When the Dancing Stopped, The Real Story of the Morrow Castle Disaster and Its Deadly Wake. The Morrow Castle, Tragedy at Sea. Shipwreck, The Strange Fate of the Morrow Castle. We also have a multitude of information available through our databases, and please see the Works Cited slide for reputable sites regarding the Morrow Castle disaster. As we near the end of this program, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the lives claimed by the Morrow Castle disaster. To some, they may be mere names on a page. To others, though, these victims were best friends, husbands, wives, partners, children. Each of these victims was another person's whole world, their everything. While their pain and suffering is now 87 years in the past, let's reflect on the depth of what they went through and maybe hold your loved ones a little tighter tonight. Please join me in a moment of silence. I want to sincerely thank you all for taking the time to attend this program on the Morrow Castle disaster. I hope you were able to gain an understanding of the tragedy that occurred that September day in 1934, and I do hope your interest was piqued enough to want to learn more. There are so many stories of loss and love and courage that I was not able to include here, but believe me, those stories would be well worth your time. Support public libraries, like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.